you been having poor health due to oxalate overload? Or do you have no idea what I'm even talking about when I say oxalate? Either way, this interview is for you. Today, we're joined by Sally Norton, the foremost expert on oxalates, and she will dig into what they are, why they're a problem, and how you can fix it. Trust me, this woman is a gem. And this could be the 60 minutes that completely changes your life. Give it a watch and let me know if you have any questions. My guest today is Sally Norton. She has a nutrition degree from Cornell as well as a master's in public health. And she is the author of Toxic Superfoods, How Oxalate Overload is Making You Sick and How to Get Better. Sally, it's such an honor to have you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. We're going to have fun. I'm excited. Well, let's just dive in to the very basics from the get-go. What are oxalates and what's so bad about them? Yeah, that's a big question. Just knowing what oxalates are because nobody talks about them. And so it's brand new concept, but this little chemical called oxalic acid is the parent molecule. It's little, they call it a dicarbolic acid, which means it has uh, two oxygens attached to a carbon twice. So there's two carbons, two oxygen, and this little thing is all over nature and plants make it, funguses make it. Certain plants that we eat make a lot of it and they turn it also into calcium oxalate crystals because oxalic acid is a chelator. It grabs minerals, it grabs positively charged things. It has a, either a single or a double negative charge on it and that allows it to connect as an ion. That's an ion, something with a charge that can connect with other things, dries out into a salt. In water, it floats around as this charged particle, but then when it's dried out, it's connected to something, usually a mineral. And we use this powdered oxalic acid to clean stuff. We've been using it in industrial cleaning since the late 1700s. You can bleach cottons and leather and wood and etch things and take rust out of engines. You can still use it if you buy by Barkeeper's Friend, you're buying oxalic acid is a cleaner. Taking away minerals is a powerful cleaning thing. All those oxygens are powerfully oxidative. In fact, it is an oxidated kind of compound. It's an end product of a chemical reaction called oxidation. Um, not so good for our health to be eating something that steals minerals, that has corrosive abilities. It can mess with almost anything because it's a, such a small molecule and it's interrupting our control over our electrolytes in our blood and other tissues. Because when we eat it, it gets into the bloodstream, a certain amount of it, not all of it, about 10 to 15% if you have perfect digestion. But if you have leaky gut, you could absorb a lot more. And so your chances of having it cause you health problems get worse if you have intestinal problems. That sounds terrible. <laughs> so what symptoms might someone experience if they're ingesting too many of these oxalates? Sometimes you don't really notice any symptoms, but <clears throat> that's partially because you don't know to connect it with your food. It can happen as a lag time because you, you eat it, it can affect your mouth and throat and stomach in ways you won't really notice. But as it gradually comes out of your stomach and intestines in your bloodstream, it gets higher and higher. So four or five hours after eating, you could notice things like twitches, tremors, belching, headaches, fatigue, stomach ache, heart rate changes, um, even suddenly needing to go to the bathroom really urgently, having to wake up at night to pee because the, the way the body is gonna get it out of the bloodstream primarily is through the kidneys cleaning the blood and you're excreting it in your urine and peeing out oxalate crystals, which can become a problem for some people, it starts to become a bladder irritant that turns on mast cells and other immune activity. You can sort of create a rash. You can create minor damage that turns on inflammation and you can have a like L perma rash in your bladder and end up with a condition called interstitial cystitis that can wake you up whenever, make you run to the bathroom with for like a tablespoon. It can become really painful. And that's really pain as a big part of oxalate poisoning for a lot of people. Physical pain, it can create arthritis, fibromyalgia, muscle knots, and they can be worse at nighttime. People also get into emotional pain because it's, an, uh, it's damaging to neurons. It's a neurotoxin. And for some people, neurotoxic inflammation causes depression and anxiety. 
but it can just cause you to be having brain farts and being kind of foggy and a little bit struggling with your brain. <laughs> and that includes sleep. So if your sleep isn't great, if you don't wake up refreshed, if you're waking up a lot, having trouble falling asleep, these could be potentially the neurotoxic effects of the oxalate. And interestingly, after a day of eating oxalates, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, the blood levels of oxalic acid are at their worst at bedtime. Mm. So if the symptoms, if you tend to feel worse at bedtime or when you wake up in the morning, that could be another symptom of it being related to your diet. It stinks that it's so varied because it's so hard to pinpoint what's going on. And I, I can understand why it goes undiagnosed for so long for people or maybe undiagnosed forever. And I understand that you personally had your own experience with Oxalate, which is part of why you wrote this book in the first place. So what can you tell us about your experience? Yeah, I, I started struggling as a little kid. And, and by the time I was 12, I was having back pain and arthritis and mm -hmm. trouble focusing and trouble studying. I wanted to learn stuff and get decent grades. And I, it really was a battle for me to stay focused and to not just feel mental fatigue. And I realized that was a, probably layers of toxicity that included my willingness and interest in eating beet greens and beets and chard and healthy vegetables and lots of fruits and things like uh, fruited Christmas cakes, you know, this, this sort of bread my grandfather used to make with the citrus peel in it and rhubarb. My mom grew rhubarb and we played with it and ate it. And my mom made a really good rhubarb crisp and tea. I would make tea after high school. I come home and make a big cup of iced tea and watch a soap opera. <laughs> and so I was eating a lot of oxalate and didn't know it and was having different issues. And it became in college, I developed a foot problem that required me to leave school for foot surgery. I was really quite lame with one foot and then it became both feet. And I didn't recover well from that. And I developed additional problems with fatigue and arthritis was plaguing me through really, it's got really bad in my, <clears throat> around the time I was like 18. It was horrible all through my twenties. And I, I never connected it to my diet. It was craziness because that was the final insight later on when I was 49, that when I added back oxalate foods, because when I was uh, about three years before that, I learned that some people thought oxalate was connected to pelvic pain. Genital pain and other forms of pelvic pain can be relieved if you quit eating high oxalate foods. And that was a weird concept to me. And I thought that was the only problem with it and didn't know that it could be connected to my arthritis. But I was now becoming more aware of when I was eating oxalate and when I wasn't, which is so sad that someone with a public health degree and a degree in nutrition from Cornell, which is considered one of the finest schools for nutrition. How could I not be oxalate aware? How could I not know which foods really, even though I know we need this diet for kidney patients because oxalic acid is the principal ingredient in a kidney stone. So we know that if you quit feeding the body, the ingredient that makes a kidney stone, that helps with kidney stones. And you sure, certainly have no business eating high oxalate foods if you have kidney stones. Well, that I'm aware of and kidney disease generally. But I didn't know about all this other stuff. And I didn't really have a good idea of where the oxalate was in the foods. If you go back, I went back and looked at my textbook and, and textbooks are written by committee. So each chapter is assigned to the expert that understands that in a typical uh, textbook. So one chapter mentions oxalate and lists like six or eight foods. And then another chapter mentions oxalate and lists a different 10 foods and they don't match. <laughs> And nobody seems to care. Like the editors don't care when they pull together their textbooks that the, these subjects aren't handled in any comprehensive way. They're mentioned kind of offhand and there's no consistency within the own textbook. So you come out of school thinking nobody cares about Oxley because it doesn't really matter. And it does. And it, I shipwrecked on this stuff to the point where I could no longer work and I needed a hysterectomy. I was bleeding to death after the hysterectomy. I felt so bad. I just couldn't even imagine coming back to work. I couldn't even read my own mail. And the endocrinologist says, now I don't have any ovaries anymore. So I have to figure out what to do about the hormonal problem of just suddenly going to nothing. 
and he couldn't find anything much wrong with me. So he sends me to the sleep doctor, which is his default answer when there's no answers in the sleep lab study, you know, they hook you up with all this wires and somehow you manage to sleep, but I, my brain couldn't sleep. I was out to lunch, didn't notice much going on except the wires, but the report demonstrated that the brain was waking up. My brain was waking up every hour, 29 times per hour, 29 times an hour. That's not sleep. And then I went on a three-year odyssey of like, what's wrong with my toxic brain? What's causing it? And the literature said it was endotoxemia from bacterial overgrowth and it's got to be SIBO. And since I had all this bloating and belching for years at bedtime and just general digestive problems, I thought it must be SIBO because SIBO is the current answer to everything. Mm -hmm. It wasn't SIBO. I tested negative for SIBO, but still SIBO was the only answer. That's the only answer. You got to treat SIBO. So I'm taking meds for a disease I don't have because I'm desperate to sleep. Without sleep, I don't have a life. And um, turned out all that digestive bloating and belching and problems was just oxalate poisoning. And the sleep mm -hmm. problem was just oxalate poisoning. And the arthritis was just oxalate poisoning. And the back problems I'm having is oxalate poisoning and probably the brain fog and all that stuff all along was because I like beets and, and sweet potatoes. Was there one aha moment that you just realized, oh, this is what's going on or did it just happen over time? Well, I was um, shocked to learn about the fact that there's this vulva pain foundation, vulvar pain foundation that's been teaching the pelvic pain piece of it. So that started me being more conscious of, you know, I quit growing sweet potatoes for a couple of years and mm -hmm. really lowered them. But when I got rid of the sweet potatoes, <clears throat> I didn't really notice that I was hugely better with anything. And, you know, I thought I was sort of over the arthritis at this stage in life, because that was like back when I was a vegan and vegetarian. That's when the arthritis was really killing me. And now it has sort of moved on to other things. And this is what happens, you know. You're so right in saying what's so frustrating and annoying about this is that there's many different expressions of oxalate poisoning and those expressions in one person's body and life can change. So it was really bad arthritis and fatigue in my twenties and it became other things later where I was bleeding now and I was you know, trying to treat certain things. So you can kind of play whack-a-mole and think you're addressing like 15 different mm -hmm. problems when in fact, they're all rooted in the same toxicity problems. So I, it was these, these three years of being more aware when I'm eating oxalates or not, that I had the mm -hmm. opportunity to notice a connection. And so I, in order to fix the SIBO that I didn't have, or to fix mm -hmm. the constipation that I know I had so that I could sleep, I started eating two kiwi a day and sometimes more. Kiwi has these lovely oxalate crystals that are like toothpicks. They're really microscopic little blow darts that are two pointed points on each end designed to injure you. And of course the body doesn't like it when you eat irritants. And so that can promote a certain amount of spasticity in the colon where the body's kind of toxic with crystals and wants to get rid of them. And so therefore kiwis can sometimes help with constipation. But they don't tell you that's the mechanism. They just know that if you give people kiwis, sometimes it helps with constipation because you're basically putting nasty glass shreds into your system. So, but I didn't know that that was, but I did know I was eating oxalate and oxalate, oxalic acid and crystals. And when I started doing that in August, by, this was 2013, mid-August, I started doing the kiwi experiment, desperate to sleep. By October, I'm laying in bed in pain, arthritis all over again. And during the course of those months, I, I'm at the time I was attending a Bikram hot yoga class, which is 90 minutes of yoga, three, sometimes four days a week in the same routine, exact same poses, the same script, everything's the same, the humidity, the temperature in the room. And over that time period, I was getting stiffer and stiffer and stiffer mm. and having a harder and harder time doing these poses. Now I started teaching myself yoga <clears throat> with this series when I was pro probably in about 1984. So my body knows about these poses more or less. 
I'm getting worse. All of a sudden I'm getting older and stiffer and more arthritic and more tension in my body, really struggling. And I'm laying in bed in October thinking, what is going on? And it dawned on me, the main thing that's going on is this Kiwi experiment, mm -hmm. this foray into using oxalates, thinking that there was some better benefit that I could ignore oxalates because I don't have vulva pain. So I could just ignore oxalates and have them. And, and then I was like, my arthritis, oh, I was, the big insight was all that arthritic suffering, which was intense, which I would never want anyone to have inflammation, swelling, weakness, the whole thing. I'm in my twenties and I'm like lame. All of that was because I like these mm -hmm. oxalate foods. I, I was like, that was a light bulb moment. That was a moment of like, oh, but it was also really mind-blowingly like, oh, you know what I mean? I've got this sleep problem. I have this digestive problem. I have these other things. And now mm -hmm. I have to deal with this arthritis, with this stupid low oxalate thing. Like I wasn't into it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to sleep. I wanted to be able to work again. I wanted to be able to function. I didn't want to have this other project too. I have enough problems. So I did it, you know, kind of like a brother. And it, 10 days later, I'm reading the mail and I'm sleeping and I'm, everything's starting to feel better. And that really grabbed my attention. I'm like, what? Are you kidding? Like many things are connected to this oxalate thing. It's not just the arthritis. And then six months later, my feet are happy again. For the first time mm -hmm. in 30 years, I can wear heels for seven hours. I could wear heels. That had not happened in my entire adult, adult life until several months into this low oxalate thing. I was like, oh yeah, connective tissue. There's something going on there too. But I was too stupid to, I could have put this together sooner. But we don't know about this and it's completely out of the radar. And when you think you know stuff, you can't learn very well. That's incredible. So like you're talking about, we don't know, no one's talking about it. Well, in your book, you cite research going hundreds of years back where they're talking about the dangers of oxalate. So what do you think happened? Like, why did that knowledge fall out of favor? And why is diagnosing oxalate overload so difficult? Yeah, I really wanted to put that in my book. I have a whole chapter on why we don't know about oxalates because I started giving free lectures and people would say to me, but, but plants are so good for us. And, and everyone's like, oxalate? What's an oxalate? Huh? It's like, why don't we know? We should know. I was so shocked when I started doing the deeper research and I would go back and someone would claim something based on certain references. And I'd go back and look at the references to see if those mm -hmm. claims made any sense. And you just go deeper and deeper and back and back. And you see these little clues and it takes you all the way back to the 1700s. And in the, the 1840s, they knew that overeating rhubarb, a high oxalate food and other high, which, and they were a little foggy, like I have been about what foods are high in oxalate, justifiably so in 1820, because they didn't have the, the scientific technology to really easily isolate oxalate out of these foods, because foods are made of tens of thousands of compounds and to separate out oxalate and not have it, the vitamin C turn into oxalate, which it does right there in the Petri dish and so on that um, is really tricky. They are really just getting good at this complicated fluids from bodies or from plants really just got good at this about 35 years ago, 40 years ago. So the, they didn't really know at the time, but they knew when you ate too much rhubarb, some people would get very sick with digestive problems. And it's really it's cha big changes in their personality they would become mm -hmm. worried and anxious and neurotic and hard to deal with and fussy and irritable and fearful. It, that was a clear setup. And they saw the digestive problems, sometimes obstruction. They saw the arthritis, they saw the pain syndromes, and they saw that oxalate crystals were in the urine when this was going on. They saw that there was urinary tract issues as well and had documented that. And then we got away from it. And it really was a medical diagnosis among the few physicians who really adopted this idea. Not everyone, it was always slightly controversial, but you could diagnose oxalic acid syndrome or the oxalic acid diathesis from 1840 to about 1940. So for about a hundred years, 
it was in the diagnostic schema. And then we decided medicine needed to be an exclusive, top of the mountain kind of healthcare, and we could eliminate the competitors in chiropractic and homeopathy and midwifery and these other things that were competing in the 18 and 1900s with medicine by going high tech in medicine. So we were going to become also objective about defining a health problem and treating it using blood tests and supposed objective testing rather than having a conversation and using instinct and experience and, uh, and thinking well about a patient. We're going to take blood and measure blood and blood will tell us everything we need to know about a health problem, but it doesn't tell you anything you need to know about your oxalate poisoning. So you can make it invisible by insisting that all diseases are just what we can measure in the blood and what we have drugs to test. And that's where we've moved in medicine where anything that we can't test for and can't treat with a, with a pharmaceutical or a surgical procedure is basically marginalized and ignored. I hear you saying that. I think of all these other conditions besides oxalate stuff like leaky gut, for example. I mean, if you say that to your doctor, they're just going to roll their eyes and move on. At least that's been my experience. And it definitely was the case back about 25 years ago. Like I remember reading in Newsweek, or I think it was Newsweek, which was a weekly news magazine, which doesn't exist anymore, about how this leaky gut business is just total crap. And of course, now there's millions of researchers like talking about uh, extra, um, you know, the tight junctions in the that hold the cells together. So cells are built with these membranes that have proteins embedded in them. And there are certain membrane proteins that are like Velcro hooks that hold cells together. So you can make a nice, smooth, tight collection of cells that line the gut, for example. And that single layer of cells is all hooked together with these proteins. And that's called the tight junction. And that, but the Velcro, if you were to think about Velcro, there's airspace between the hooks, right? Mm -hmm. So that think of it as a water space between the hooks. That's how that's called paracellular transit. When your sodium and your vitamins and your other minerals and your oxalates float through that Velcro hook into the body. So in an healthy gut, those hooks work well, but in an unhealthy gut, the cells are not uh, working well. Those proteins aren't as tightly connected and you have wider gaps between the cells that more stuff gets in. So that mm -hmm. happens when there's inflammation and other problems going on. And oxalate takes great advantage of that because that's its main way into the body is floating between the cells. And the, when the cells are leakier, you can up the absorption rate from 10% up to 50% or worse of the amount that you're eating which makes even a lower, modestly low oxalate diet pretty toxic when you've got gut infl inflammation. So yeah, leaky gut is a real thing. It's, it's documented over and over again. We know that these cells and tight junctions get messed up with inflammation and your doctor is not paying attention when they're rolling their eyes at you. So you've mentioned already uh, rhubarb and kiwi and beets, but what, which other foods are the worst offenders when it comes to oxalates? Well, the worst offenders are the ones that you've made friends with and you like to eat a lot. So it, it's different for each person because not everyone's doing chia bowls, hemp mm -hmm. seeds, turmeric, everything, spinach smoothies. Spinach is the poster child of high oxalate foods. And there are two foods that are worse than spinach. And that is chard and the green tops of the beets. So beet tops and chard, which is actually the same vegetable. It's just chard is a beet that doesn't know how to make a beet. And red chard and, and beets are worse than the white chard. So those are the really bad ones are these dark leafy greens. When they say dark leafy greens, they mean chard, beets, and spinach that you see in these little salad mixes. And the, the beets are so cute because they have little red veins in them. You know, their little stalks are red. You see this in all the salad mixes. People use that in their smoothies. Kale is not so bad in oxalate. It's the other dark leafy green is kale. And because they're dark and leafy, spinach and kale are spoken in the same breath. Oh, mm -hmm. kale and spinach. People love to hate on kale. There's a lot of good reasons to hate on kale, um, but oxalate isn't one of them. <laughs> 
So that's um, the greens. Then there's the roots. So you've got potatoes and sweet potatoes. Now, those of us with gut problems and allergy problems rely on sweet potatoes because it's not gluten and it's not legumes mm -hmm. and it's not all this other stuff that's potentially corrosive to your gut health. And you think, oh, sweet potatoes are innocent and full of beta carotene and they're so yummy. And if you put enough salt and butter on them, you can eat them over and over again and be perfectly happy because it's a great carbohydrate substitute for bread. And if you're a mm -hmm. carb addict, which all of us ex-vegans are carb addicts, then you like something like sweet potatoes. That's what I did to myself. I started using sweet potatoes as my morning oatmeal and my evening side dish and was eating it mm. at least once a day. Big mistake. So the beets themselves aren't good. And then if you go gluten-free, you may not just be doing sweet potatoes. You may be trying to make breads and puddings with teff or mm. quinoa or buckwheat. Buckwheat noodles, like soba noodles are delicious all evilly high in oxalate. So you can go from a gluten-based diet that's bad enough for your gut, then go to a gluten-free diet that's worse because now you're on things that are even worse than gluten for your gut because of the high oxalate. Now, bran is full of oxalate. So the, if you go to whole wheat instead of white or using rice bran or oat bran for soluble fiber or whatever, you're getting more oxalate by adding bran to your diet. And then what else is there? In the fruits, there's the blackberries. People love to throw blackberries into their smoothies, kiwi, as I mentioned. And then there's the nuts. Nuts, mm -hmm. almonds, cashews, peanuts are probably the worst offenders in the nut department, even though peanut is technically a legume. We call it peanut. We all think of it as a nut because it's low carb, high fat, and uh, we eat it just like a nut. So call it a nut they're used in childhood. Chocolate's another one. So mm. you graduate from breastfeeding, you turn one and they give you a big slab of chocolate cake. And now the conscious parents will make your chocolate cake with sweet potatoes and almond butter and almond flour. It basically poison you when you have little baby kidneys and you can't handle it. It's a big problem putting people and children on supposed milk that's made from plants like ground up almonds and water and chemicals is being called milk and people think that means it's like a nutritious food and they substitute dairy milk, which is calcium, potassium, protein, vitamins, vitamin A, vitamin D and so on for eight ground up almonds plus chemicals and water. And what you've done is you've turned the soluble oxalic acid in the almonds into this loose ion floating in water. Remember the tight junctions with the Velcro, when you dilute oxalic acid and it's floating in the water of the almond milk or the spinach smoothie, it can so much more easily float into your bloodstream. It's worse than if it was all clunked together and say the, the almond flour where it's concentrated, there's a concentrated stuff that doesn't break up as easily and it's not as just the more dilute, the more of it can just easily come in with water because you're absorbing the water from your food along with oxalic acid. I know I'm not alone in this, but before I changed my diet to what it is now, I swear for years, every day, my badge of honor was this spinach smoothie with just handfuls of spinach, almond milk and peanut butter, and then whatever else I threw in there but it was those things every time. And it was a huge, huge container. And I mean, I would have to kind of gag it down, but I felt so good about it. And so not only was it just the worst foods when it comes to oxalates, but like you said, I was grinding everything up, pulverizing, liquefying and using the almond milk. And now I just look back and think, what the heck was I doing? And, you know, that's when I was having the worst of my skin problems. So in retrospect, I'm sure it was related. Skin problems is another thing we didn't talk about, but that's really common and is different people are prone to the skin issues. And so some of us, our skin is holding up, although mine was really thin. And one gynecologist said to me, your thin, your skin is so thin. You get this frail connective tissue that can show up as thin skin, skin mm -hmm. that easily breaks and you get hangnails easily. And then it's slow to recover and you're just sort of fragile, but other people get eczema and bumps and boils and skin tags and all kinds of weirdness on the skin. 
Yeah, yeah. So you, I think it's really interesting that you ask, like, what was I doing? Well, what you're doing is following the big trance that we're all in. Every single health outlet has been promoting spinach and vegetables is the right thing to do with no breaks. You can have as much as you want. More is always better. That's our culture. More, 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 more is better. Stuff it into a smoothie and you're with the cool kids. Anybody in the know knows to do spinach smoothies now. It's this big cultural trance. And so we don't see it for ourselves. I couldn't see it for myself. And you don't, if someone doesn't clue you in, and that's why I thought, my God, I can't be the only one who's sick trying to be healthy. <laughs> There's got to be other people like me trying to be healthy and it's not working and they can't even notice that it isn't working. They just, if it doesn't work, the answer is usually do more of it. So why not have a second smoothie after work? Yeah, get sicker and sicker. So speaking of spinach, I mean, let's talk about the paradox of nutrition in spinach. So I remember even as a kid, and I'm aging myself here, watching Popeye and thinking because of the way they promote spinach in that cartoon, it's like a cute little thing. I thought I have to eat my spinach to grow big and strong. And I, I recently read something about how in the 1930s, American spinach consumption went up like 33%. Um, during, during that decade, because of pop, at least partly because of Popeye, but based on what I read in your book, spinach is not as nutritious as we're led to believe. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah. And this is another thing where the history just really makes you mad because they knew in the 1930s when that cartoon came out around that same time. And it was a time where we were becoming nutritionally enlightened that there were vegetables and well, foods have vitamins in them. This was a new concept by the late 1800s. This is a new concept. We knew about minerals and probably they're good, but knowing that there's essential minerals and essential vitamins was a new thing. And so they were starting to isolate these compounds to say, well, compound X that helps so-and-so like scurvy was an early example of this, where the sailors that, you know, the Brits were great sailors. That's how they became Kind of dominant across the globe because they could conquer the sea and they would put these guys on boats with dried meat and they'd be living on biscuits and flour and things like that and not much fresh fruit and with all that flour they, they were becoming vitamin c deficient so eventually they figured out that they needed citrus fruit either lemons or limes on board so the the term for a sailor became limey because these guys mm -hmm. had to have lime juice to survive. So that was one of the early examples of showing that you needed certain, some magical something in the limes to feel better. And they started wanting to isolate what these chemicals were. So it was a, we're really into this in the 1930s, like, okay, how much of this and what foods have it and what, how's it gonna go? And also what was happening at that time was the um, whole industrial production of food was ramping up. People were now working in factories as jobs. They weren't on the farm with the family canning their own foods and living on farm fresh foods and being able to cook breakfast, lunch, and dinner at home because the employees were living in near their house. Now you had to truck off to a big factory somewhere to work and you grabbed your biscuits and took them with you to work and lived on bad food again. So the canning industry was ramping up the big industrial farming and the whole grocery world was waking up because people weren't as self-sufficient with food. We had the trains now that could bring in foods from California and these canning things. So the canning industry wanted to prove to people that canned foods were okay to eat because people had their own canned goods at home in glass. It looked much, now they're giving you tin cans and you just eat out of a tin can inherently that can't taste as good as stuff um, fresh cooked and put in glass jars. Mm -hmm. So people were suspicious of it. So the canning industry wanted to protect its reputation, really build faith and trust in their products, just like brainwashing people to buy margarine instead of using lard and butter. So they would shame people into, you need to be frugal. This is cheaper than lard and butter. You should be buying our oleo margarine. So the same thing with canning, they were doing research in the canning industry to demonstrate that it was nutritious. So this one guy fed a can diet to rats and added spinach to make up for the calcium because there's a lot of calcium in spinach if you just test it for calcium. And the rats died 
many of them, they couldn't reproduce. One of the pups, one of them produced stillbirth babies and ate the babies. The, the others couldn't reproduce at all. And most of them had, they all had bad fur, yucky fur, thin bones. They were underweight, couldn't reproduce and died young when they use spinach to flush out the diet. And that was oxalate causing severe calcium deficiency. Mm. High calcium food, he was using it for calcium, but it's all oxalic acid calcium. So it's calcium oxalate, not real oxalate. And it's blocking the use of calcium in the food. And therefore it is a zero or less than zero amount of calcium in this high calcium food. That's called bioavailability. That's a concept that nutrition is still not paying attention to. So we're still claiming, here we are a hundred years later, claiming that spinach is good in minerals, good in calcium. And we've known for a long, 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 long time that not only is it not good, but it causes calcium deficiency. This was shown not just in rat studies, but in human feeding studies and was repeated over the years on and off that there is really no nutritional value from a calcium standpoint in spinach. But literally online today, people tell you, you get calcium from spinach. That's so frustrating. So let's move on to something a little bit more positive. (laughs) You mentioned in the book that it's not hopeless. There are easy swaps you can make to easily decrease the oxalate you're intaking. So what are some easy swaps? Yeah, this is really a message of great hope. Like you don't have to keep suffering. You don't have to be someone who's a health nut who doesn't feel good. You can just learn where oxalates are. And instead of spinach, you can use arugula. You can use any lettuce, leaf lettuces, and almost all the other greens that aren't the three bad ones. Don't eat sorrel. That's the fourth bad one. Who eats sorrel, right? Just cut out the spinach and use something else. Romaine lettuce, it's easy. It's easy to find. It keeps really well. It's delicious, it's crunchy, it's versatile. There's plenty of leafy greens. Instead of black beans and white beans, you can use black eyed peas, chickpeas, and um, green peas and lentils. But their legumes are high in lectins, which is another plant chemical, very different than oxalates. Oxalates, tiny and visible. Lectins are enormous proteins that you change them slightly with three days soaking and then you pressure cook or high cook heat cook them to disarm those big proteins. So they're not so damaging. So you have to be careful with them. I wouldn't use a lot of like these red lentil pastas and stuff because they're not properly prepared. So the lectins are a problem in the beans, but there are some very low oxalate foods. So people who are vegans and vegetarians really do have low oxalate options. Um, And that's a good place to start. Just start with, with, what you're eating. If you're eating chia and hemp, just quit that. You never needed that. That's a brand new silly idea. Just, you don't need a substitute for that. You need to go back to actual food, yogurt, Mm -hmm. cheese, hard boiled eggs, something that's actual food. That's not food. Um, You have blueberries instead of blackberries. That's easy enough. And with the nuts, Mm, nuts are not really good news. If you're just transitioning down though, pumpkin seeds have very, very little oxalate and you can make pumpkin seeds into butter and spread. And it works pretty well. If you're, if you're used to like sesame butter, you know, tahina, you can use the pumpkin seed instead. Not really big on a lot of seed stuff. You can use white rice though, especially if you soak it and get rid of the phytates, which is another chemical in them. The plants are loaded with things that are designed to hurt us or that just do hurt us. Plants need them for their own physiology. They really are not trying to like, oh, let's be non-toxic so humans can love us, love to eat us and put us out of business. Like that's not their job to be (laughs) non-toxic. We think plants are so sweet and benign. They just sit there waving in the sun, wanting to be picked and eaten. (laughs) That's not actually their agenda. They're pretty smart. And that's why they're still on the planet. If they were so non-toxic and innocent, then they wouldn't exist anymore. So keep that in mind. (laughs) You can overdo any kind of plant. And but unfortunately now we're being told to overdo them. You know, oh, more, you need seven servings a day, 10 servings. They can't get enough more. It's better. More is better. It's not. So there are, there are plenty of substitutes, but ideally you want to include some animal foods in your diet if you can. 
But if you're still afraid of that, there's plenty of things you can do in that. And ultimately the nerve toxicity will go down and your, your sense of safety will go up and your willingness to consider adding cheese or eggs to your diet will probably expand. Your body will start being able to talk to you. I, I found this to be true. When I stopped eating so much sweet potatoes and chard, my body was able to tell me, hey, I don't actually like cabbage, even though you think it tastes great and you like it. I, the body, mm, not so much. And so I was able to hear and get direction from my body when I got oxalates out of the way. Interesting. I find that the more constraint I put on my diet, the more my body talks to me too. So that's an interesting finding. Now, most of my audience is carnivore or ketovore or something like that. So they're really not eating much, if any oxalates anyway, but you say in the book that going to a zero oxalate diet is not exactly good. So why is that? Well, some proportion of people are going to struggle with the fact that they're loaded with oxalate. Now, actually, we're all loaded with oxalate. Like the one thing we didn't talk about is how much oxalate can accumulate in tissues. So when you're eating peanut butter and whole wheat toast and salads and whatever, most of us, you might be eating just meat now, but you didn't grow up eating just meat. People were handing you tater tots at school, French fries at lunch, mm -hmm. chips at parties. Like you're eating potatoes like crazy. That's a high oxalate food. That's a really common problem. We grow up on peanut butter, potatoes, and chocolate. And then we mix nuts and chocolate together, like the classic Reese's cup and the peanut M&Ms. Like we all grew up on that. So we're, we're all prone to having oxalate crystals in our thyroid glands, our bone marrow, our kidneys, our bones, our tendons, wherever, because the capillary beds push oxalate into your tissues after you eat these foods. So four hours after your whole wheat peanut butter toast, with blackberries, your body is now holding oxalate in those tissues. And then you go and have like some kind of spinach sub or something for lunch. And then you have, I don't know, chocolate snack and some nuts here and there. We're putting it in every day. So you've got this body load. And when you go down to zero, that's when your body gets a chance to get rid of this stuff. The problem, the load is building up because we don't take a long break from the oxalates. But once you get away from all those plant foods that are high oxalate, this is a great opportunity <clears throat> to get better in terms of the body's ambition to be unburdened by oxalate. But for some people, this means they're getting really sick because there's so much on board. If it's, a lot of it starts mobilizing out of tissues, it can dump it back into the bloodstream or turn on inflammation. It's the immune cells that have to come along It basically beat on your tissues to get rid of these crystals. You know, it's like surgery. Your immune cells are these surgeons with rough tools. They're using like jackhammers and acid sprays and proteases to break down these deposits that are in your tissues. And then you have to turn it back into the toxic oxalic acid and nanocrystals that are now running around in your bloodstream and coming out through the kidneys, possibly through the colon, possibly through the, the fluids of the eyes and the saliva, mucus coming up out of the lungs can all be part of the body trying to remove oxalate. And if this is too much at one time, it's really toxic and dangerous. We don't know who's going to go through these episodes of oxalate mobilization and get sick, but you could end up in the emergency room with, uh, with heart palpitations and high blood pressure because you're affecting the calcium level in your bloodstream, which affects the pacemaker mm -hmm. and oxalates collect in the heart itself. So it can be happening right there near the pacemaker, right there in the heart tissues, or just happening in the vascular system where the blood itself is having trouble maintaining calcium levels. And, and that's occurring day to day where your body's having to find calcium to make up for the fact that you're eating these anti-calcium foods that lower calcium levels in the body so what you end up with over time is osteopenia and osteoporosis and you get acidity, which encourages the osteopenia and osteoporosis. So you don't want to keep that going. You don't want to keep mm -hmm. sucking your bones dry. You don't want to keep the inflammation going. You don't want to keep oxalate high in your kidneys and your bloodstream. So you have to try to moderate the body's ambition to get rid of this stuff. And the slower you can do it is lowering the poisonous dose of the sort of auto intoxication process. So if you go to zero oxalate, go straight to a carnivore diet, some people get away with that for 
a honeymoon period that can last between two days and eight years. But at some point, you might get a set of symptoms of bad sleep, irritable bladder, hip pain, grumpy mood, loss of coordination where you become klutzy and just where your brain is getting that inflammation. Mood problems like anxiety, depression can be related to this inflammation and to this deaccumulation process. So we don't know who's going to run into deaccumulation crises, but an awful lot of us who have been focused on our health are just loaded with this stuff. And you got to be careful about that. So if you could go into the switch from a plant-based or plant-heavy diet to a meat-based diet with awareness of oxalate, your chances of interpreting your response to a meat diet is better because now, you know, it's not really the meat making you sick. It's the old oxalate. It's the old, the residues of the plant-based diet that is causing bad symptoms often on a carnivore diet. Interesting. So I actually just got a question yesterday from one of my followers and she, she described exactly what you seem to be describing. She has had issues with, well, mostly skin issues, um, specifically vasculitis. And she went on a carnivore diet. I don't know how long ago within the last year. And she said she was getting better. And then now it's just like flared up worse than ever. And she already knew about you and knew about oxalate. So she was kind of already on that path. But for someone like that, who maybe went carnivore is eating zero oxalates. And now they're seeing the repercussions of that probably in this oxalate mobilization. What are some action steps that they can take some foods they can add back to dampen the symptoms? Right. So the body's not dumb. It's it's aware that your oxalate level went down and now it's doing this healing work and it's getting really good at it. Your kidneys are getting better after a while and you're able to excrete it better. And that's all encouraging the process. So you want to discourage the process of the cleaning out too, too viciously or too excitedly by adding some oxalate back in. And you can do that with the two tea bags and turn it into a nice cup of tea. That often works for people who tolerate tea. You can do it with a scoop of sweet potato or some foods with oxalate in them. I have a whole table in the back of the book called the dosing table. And in there, it gives you a sense of how much of a certain food you might need to add 20 milligrams or 30 milligrams of oxalate, or you could do 50 or whatever. It's really pretty safe to play around with adding back some oxalate because what you're doing is you're lowering that autotoxemia happening from inside. So that's one way to do it. Some people need to take some vitamin C to support the immune cells and make them behave better. And vitamin C is an interesting thing because it turns into oxalate in the body. It gets into cells and inside cells, it can become oxalate. And so it's small amounts, it's pretty safe to use. And you can actually use it to be another way of adding oxalate to the body and supporting the immune system. But we're talking about like 50 milligrams, three times a day which is relatively tiny because your most supplements start at 500 or a thousand milligrams, a whole gram. That is really toxic because that's going to create a lot of oxalate in the body. So you don't want big doses of vitamin C, but little doses can help a lot. Another thing you can do is use lemon juice, which will lower the acidity caused by all this oxalate uh, moving around and the related inflammation increases the acidity in the body. So we use calcium and calcium citrate to lower the acidity, to provide the binder that helps the body remove oxalate. It stays in the colon, a lot of calcium that you take. And there's a binder that encourages excretion, but really just adding back some oxalate foods, if you, some olives, it's all kinds of foods you can use to add some oxalate back. And that can be surprisingly good medicine. So it's kind of all, you got to know most medicines have a certain degree of toxicity, but small amounts of oxalate is a pretty low toxicity for the benefit you can get from slowing down that sort of deaccumulation illness. For some people, it makes them really nervous to do. I was always nervous to do it. I never really did a lot of that dosing because I didn't understand the, really how to do it and the value of it during the first several years I was doing this. But I see it with all my clients that sometimes a strong cup of tea is a miracle and it pulls them out of an anxiety attack 
a depression episode, uh, inability to sleep, all kinds of aches and pains, they can disappear it with a cup of tea. Hmm. So I have a couple of thoughts just from listening to you. One is, um, it sounds like what you're suggesting is probably a cup of tea or a few bites of something, but not necessarily like, here's your chocolate bar, enjoy. Um, or like having a cute, going back to the huge spinach smoothie. Like that sounds like it would probably be a little counterintuitive. Is that accurate? Yeah, right. It would be really quite terrible actually. And people do this by mistake where they forget like people who aren't on strict diet, like a carnivore thing, they'll forget they're on a slow oxide diet in just a moment of like being normal. And somebody will hand them a piece of chocolate cake or something, you know, at a party. And they're just like doing the normal thing of thinking about the social environment and not thinking about their health and to and eat a piece of chocolate cake. And this can, if you're low oxalate and you add back a high oxalate food, like a smoothie or cake, of, you know, especially the keto almond flour mm -hmm. version of chocolate cake is like really high in oxalate. Your system's already high in oxalate because you ate that so long and now it's mobilized and it's high in the bloodstream, high in your kidneys. And the system's trying to do this without showing you that you're sick with it and doing it silently, but you add that cake and that could really turn on some problems because it sort of dysregulates the body's attempt to keep the clearing mild it can throw you into this clearing illness kind of symptomology and the body can't get a handle on it and you can stay sick for weeks doing that. So it's really important that when you go to a carnivore diet and you're on zero oxalate and now you're sick because your oxalate from the past is haunting you, if you're using oxalate, it's not like, oh, I'm just gonna run back to my old diet. Now I'm gonna use oxalate judiciously and wisely. And that means if you're gonna do chocolate, it's gonna be half ounce. It's not going to be highly concentrated, giant chocolate festival. Yeah. And who can eat half an ounce? Goodness. Unless it's the really gross, dark chocolate kind. That's not that good anyway. But if, but if you're like, here, have one bite of this chocolate cake, I don't know if I could do that. Right, right, right. It, well, you could probably do one chocolate chip cookie though. Whereas you're only getting like six or seven chocolate chips and you could probably even get away with two of them. Not that anyone would say a cookie is a good nutrition, but you know, it, most people aren't as pure as they like to say they are when they're doing a certain diet style and they are doing their little, they believe in like cheat days, but you don't really get cheat days with oxalates. You just get, okay, you should keep a little oxalates in your life and you don't have to do the same thing every day, but be paying attention to whether you might be in an oxalate clearing episode and how to dose that appropriately. So you can stay within the bounds of not messing things up, making it worse. Yeah. And it is complicated, but like you said, there are lots of charts and tables in this book to really kind of help walk you through that. This is a very informational educational book, but also a very actionable book with tons of steps. So, I mean, it's something, I don't know if you can see on here, but I just have like filled it with highlights. Um, so this cool. for me will be a reference book, which I'm excited to have to, to try to help people in the future. And one thing I wanted to ask about based on what I read in the book, I got the impression that vitamin C. Yes. That's what they yeah, look that's like. That's the one we were talking about in the back of the book in the appendix with the dosing, like how much you would use. So it's right there in the book. So, yeah. Perfect. And so when I read the book, I got the impression that vitamin C is a bad thing, but I think more in the context of if you're already eating a high oxalate diet and you're also supplementing vitamin C, cause it sounds like vitamin C can become oxalate, but then you were talking about how vitamin C can be helpful. So I just want to clarify in that case, it's more, if you've eliminated oxalate foods, taking a low dose of vitamin C can be appropriate for, um, creating a low level of oxalate in your body. Is that accurate? Yes. You know, it's hard to say any kind of mathematical formula. If you're how much you're getting any oxalate out of a low dose, it probably depends on how quickly your immune cells pick up the vitamin C and put it to good use for what they're doing. And the whole process of the pathophysiology of that, or the cellular biology of that is still elusive. They're trying to understand it more, but definitely that's the thing. A lot of people who are trying to get healthy are eating salads and sweet potatoes and taking vitamin C. And that combination is especially bad. The medical literature demonstrates though, that 
what appears to be kind of a normal lower oxalate diet plus vitamin C is enough. Like vitamin C is powerful enough to cause problems. And I have a feeling it differs from person to person, mm -hmm. how much and how quickly and how obvious it is that vitamin C is a problem, how much it's converting to oxalate, but you're absolutely right. Vitamin C is a required nutrient. You don't want to go to zero vitamin C forever. You're going to need some vitamin C and uh, taking low dose is healthy in both ways. It's healthy because you need it. And it's healthy because it's an easy appropriate way to add some oxalate. If you're a carnivore and you don't want to eat foods with oxalate in them, you could use the vitamin C and the tea, which I think fits well in the boundaries of, I want a plant-free diet. That's a great tip. People ask me about this kind of thing all the time. And I, I'm always like, I don't know, Sally's the expert. And I'm going to talk to her soon. So now I'm really excited to sort of get to communicate with these people and say, Hey, sh look at this chart. She says T she says some vitamin C. I feel like I've got a new tool in my toolbox. So thank you for that. You do, because I think the carnivore world is going to be battling this oxalate clearing problem. And I've had people interview me who are just now getting into seeing this clearing illness thing. And they're, they've been on counter for over six years. Mm. They didn't see any symptoms at all. So anybody who's not eating oxalate, who used to eat them could occasionally get cranky hips and cranky attitude and not recognize that that's a healing symptom. And you could be heading into some interesting things and you want, you don't want to think, Oh, all of a sudden this isn't working for me. Although, you know, I think carnivore is a stage for a lot of people. It helps them get an elimination diet where they remove a lot of potential troublemakers and gives them a fresh start on rethinking how you eat and being more conscious about things we take for granted that we think are okay that may not be. There is a whole section in the book about um, lifestyle and supplement changes that you can use to aid in your recovery as you're detoxing from oxalates. And, um, the main thing that I felt like you were saying is that calcium is really important. And you did touch on that briefly, but is that something we could discuss just a little further on why you need calcium and how to get it when you're going through this oxalate clearing? Yeah. Calcium is sort of critical. You, you probably have a calcium deficient diet or body because the way we eat is creating calcium deficiencies and we haven't been eating, you know, milk has been the main source of calcium in the human diet for a long time. And I think when humans decided that we're going to settle down and eat plants a lot more, milk became more and more critical as a counterbalance to the oxalate and the toxins in plants. So calcium is the main binder that helps the body remove oxalate. And when you eat calcium or take it as a supplement, the majority of it stays in your digestive tract, right? So you absorb maybe 20% of the calcium that you eat or take as a supplement. And the body has some power to say, yeah, I need a lot of calcium today. I'll take a little more, thank you. And tries to up the absorption and it will, you know, uh, maybe put out more vitamin D. But if you're vitamin D deficient, it might have a little trouble absorbing more but mostly we're taking it as the binder that lives in the colon because that helps the excretion of oxalate through the colon too and tells the body it's safe to do that. So the kidneys are the main way the body wants to remove oxalate or that's what we think in science. But in fact, when the kidneys are struggling or you're acidic, which is happening on a high oxalate diet and happening during these deaccumulation crises that some people get into, the colon excretes oxalate and calcium is there is a binder that helps you not have it get back into the bloodstream. Like it could be like a leaky boat where you're trying to like empty the boat out and it keeps coming back, coming back. That could happen with oxalate potentially if there's not something in the colon to grab it. So things in the colon that grab it are fiber, calcium, and bacteria. So there's this various bacteria can eat oxalate and will, and they can tell the colon, hey, we're here, we want a meal, give us some oxalate. And that can encourage that excretion too. A lot of us have some dysbiosis or don't have a lot of these oxalate degrading bacteria. So the calcium clinically demonstrates this. It also protects you from getting calcium oxalate kidney stones. It's well documented in the literature. So I don't know how else to explain calcium, but it's important. Thank you for that. 
Now, another question that I get a lot is how can I get my loved one or my friend or whatever to do such and such diet? Because I know it would help them. It would be so useful. And I'm sure people watching this will be like, oh my gosh, how can I get my husband to stop eating so many oxalates? I know it's causing his gout or whatever the problem. And what I usually tell people is you really can't. I know that's terrible news. You don't want to hear that, but you can plant the seed if you will, but that's about it. But there's a quote in the book. It's actually the last sentence of the book. And I loved it so much. I would love to read it if you don't mind. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. You said, if you want to convince them with ideas, share this book. The most powerful truth, however, will shine from your own healed body. I just love that so much. And truly, this book is incredible. It's it's not exactly an easy read, but you learn so much and just for reference purposes, to be able to look back on, it's fantastic. So where can people find this book? You can get it anywhere. You can call your local um, book distributor and ask them to get it in for you. If they don't have it in stock, you can get it online. It comes as a, a paper book, but it also comes as an ebook and an audio book. Some people need various forms of it or have the audio read it for them. I do recommend you get the physical book because it's so much easier as a reference. It's a way to look things up. Mm -hmm. And this is a kind of book where you have to read it multiple times and go back and use it for different purposes because front to back, you cannot possibly have this sink in. There's so much to understand. It's countercultural from the way we're built to think that it just disappears out of your brain pretty quickly. So having the physical book is a great idea and you really can get it anywhere Uh, Let me know if you're having trouble getting it because I'll report that back and the the publisher will look into any kind of distribution problems, but you can get it all over the world and eventually we'll have at least five other versions in other languages. We're looking at, uh, I believe, Spanish, German, Vietnamese, Chinese, the, the Taiwanese, old school Chinese, and Polish so far. Wow, that's incredible. So related to the book or unrelated, how can people connect with you? Oh, please check out my website, sallyknorton.com. And if you want to communicate with us, use those uh, contact us buttons on the website to reach out to us. It's the best way to reach me. And uh, on there, you can find a cookbook and you can find lots of free reference resources that you can download. They're all in the kind of shopping page. Many of them are free. Get a beginner's guide there. Um, But there's a lot of information on the website, and you can also sign up for a group class. We can meet other people, and I teach a little bit, and we chat around, and we share each other's stories, which helps you not feel so alone. If you are noticing that you've got some kind of weird oxalate thing, you're not so weird. (laughs) You're just the first wave of people waking up to this. And yes, we want to save everyone else, but first you got to save yourself. work on literally learning it and and understanding it in your own body because you'll be in a better position to support others when they turn to you and go like, how come you look younger and I don't? How come you're running around and I'm not? How come you're gaining muscle and I'm not? They'll hopefully somebody will start looking to you as an example, your role model. Yeah, I love that. And I have to share one more quote. It's really about that and about just the power of hope and the power of our bodies. So one more, and then I'll give you the final word. So what your words are, have faith that your biology will write itself in the context of sound nourishment, a safe pace of lowering your toxic burden and adequate rest. Have faith that your consistent daily actions are adding up to a healthy future. Hand over the worry to God and trust your biology. I love it. So for anybody that needs that little bit of extra encouragement, because they feel like I've tried it freaking everything and nothing is working and everything is confusing and nobody can agree. What would you say to those people? That everything is confusing and nobody agrees. What do I do? Your body is the ultimate authority. The problem is, is you're not able to hear the language of your body and listen. And the more you can really like simplify your diet and be willing to like throw a few sacred cows overboard and just be free, free yourself up to have some new thoughts. Hopefully this whole book will give you so much ammunition to be like, Hey, that's right. How I've been taught to think isn't working. This is makes more sense. I can try this out. So I just want to thank you, Jennifer, because you've honed in on my message beautifully by picking up on those two quotes. 
And let's, let's really focus on that. Like you can trust your biology to heal. If it's not working, it's got to be some way that you're living. Something that you're eating or doing is interrupting your inherent magical ability to be amazing, to think, to sleep, to function, to, to have many years of life and not fall apart in the process. We're not meant to fall apart. We're probably meant to live to 120, to be productive and upright and well our whole lives. And the way we live is getting in the way of that. So we have to be willing to question the way we live and expect our biology is smarter than we are. I love that so much. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so lucky to have been able to do this and everyone watching is so lucky to have been able to hear all this straight from you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, darling. It's really been fun. Thank you so much for joining Sally and me today. It is truly my honor to have one whole hour of your attention. If you have any questions or feedback, please leave them in the comments. And if you would be so kind to please like and subscribe. And if you want, catch me on Instagram.